your stage. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the great pleasure to announce the world's first Bitcoin barkeeper, um, the man who has been accepting or who owns a, the first brick and mortar store in Berlin that the longest accepting Bitcoin place in the world, Room 77. <laughs> Um, who has shaped the, um, especially Bitcoin ecosphere significantly. He wrote the first book about Bitcoin in German. He made the first Lightning Network transaction in exchange for a real life good. Um, yeah, true Bitcoin pioneer. Let's see how he's going to talk about the death of Bitcoin. The in slow and inevitable, uh, I forgot the titles. <laughs> the inevitable yeah. and awful end of the grand Bitcoin experiment. And what comes after. So make a round of applause for Jörg Platzer. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Hey. Uh, thanks for coming in. The, the clickbait title seems to have been working. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but no worries, everybody who fell for it, I have some kind of uh, satisfaction for you. Uh, um, so this talk is uh, about, it has an official part and it has a part about stuff that concerns me. Um, and before I start, um, when I wrote my notes together for this talk, it reminded me of another talk that two people held like 15 years ago uh, on a chaos congress. And I'm looking into the audience now if I see Frank because he was one of the two guys who held that talk. Frank is not here. Anyway, I'm talking Frank Rieger, not Braun. <laughs> no Frank in the house. How is he? Oh, right, there he's hiding. That talk was uh, about uh, did we lose the war about privacy? This was like 15 years ago. And uh, because when I made my notes, I, I somehow remembered the talk and I looked it up and then you guys had a problem there actually with your talk and that was the we and they thing. So I want, I, I'm going to use the words we and the word they in my talk. So I want to define them first. When, when in the, so in this talk, when I say we, I mean the early enthusiastic Bitcoin community, all these people who when Bitcoin turned up, uh, freaked out and were like, this is it, um, I'm, I'm going to jump on this. Um, and when I talk about they or them, I mean the authoritarian state apparatus that is ruling us, that includes banks, central banks, governments and corporations. So just to make that clear. Um, I was very often asked and I needed to find an answer for myself. Uh, why is there, why has there been a certain group of people who instantly, spontaneously um, jumped onto Bitcoin when they first saw it? <coughs> and um, I came to a conclusion, because it, it is like that, you know, there, there, there were people who, who completely freak out and say that it's the best thing I saw in my life. And then there's other people um, who 10 years after Bitcoin's inception still go like, what the hell is all this about? So I came to the conclusion, this is just to define the, the us or we a little closer. I came to the conclusion that it, it took like three things that one should, one, one must have been aware of if uh, one became really enthusiastic when hearing about Bitcoin for the first time. Uh, the first one is, the belief that we need a new monetary system, a new money, better money, what Austrian economics call sound money, um, slash and freedom of transaction. So if you would not have any understanding for that, then Bitcoin doesn't make any sense. If you think Euro and fiat currency and dollar and so on is a great stuff, is a great thing, then Bitcoin doesn't make any sense in the first place. The second thing you would have to have understood is cryptography, asymmetric cryptography, public key cryptography, to, un to be able to understand that the Bitcoin protocol can actually fulfill that sound money uh, ideal. And the third thing one would have needed to understand in order to know why Bitcoin is going to be that sound money and no other coin is 
is a little understanding about the history of software development and the difference between product and protocol. Um, I actually found a great quote by Ross Ulbricht only two days ago that I just want to throw in here because it's so beautiful and it explains it again. Quote, Bitcoin was birthed onto fertile ground and was recognized by those that had been waiting for it. That's these people who had kind of understood this. Um, this was an historic moment for them, far more important than pizzas or electric bills run up from mining. The promise of freedom and the allure of destiny energized the early community. Bitcoin was consciously yet spontaneously taken up as money while no one was watching and our world will never be the same. Um, he actually deserves an applause for that, but don't interrupt my, don't interrupt my. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, obviously about a decade ago, this bunch of people who had been waiting for uh, the inception of digital cash um, looked at the Bitcoin protocol, freaked out and was like, that's it. And these people... I'm one of them, and I have to say, when I say we, I say that with a lot of pride, but um, I'm not Satoshi, I'm, I'm not a developer, I'm, I'm not one of these geniuses who actually built the stuff. I contribute what I can contribute, and that was like talking uh, and um, public relations and, and um, stuff like that. <coughs> but yeah, this group of people was kind of naive enough um, <clears throat> to think that we create the first digital bearer asset, the first thing in the information age, in the digital world that can be held by an individual <clears throat> that cannot be copied. Um, and I put my emphasis here on the word digital cash, which I want to define again. <clears throat> Um, because uh, most people make the mistake take to think that cash uh, must necessarily be notes and coins and anything digital cannot be um, cash. Uh, it's the other way around. I believe cash can be defined by certain properties. It must be able to be transferred without a middleman. The recipient can verify the transaction immediately on the spot. Transactions are final and cannot be reversed. That also means they cannot be confiscated by anyone. And the identities of the sender and the receiver are not necessary to fulfill the transaction. Um, so again, 10 years ago, <coughs> Uh, this naive group, and I remember the first years, I believe the most important property you needed to have if you were a Bitcoin enthusiast up until like five years ago was the capability to be laughed at, was to be okay with uh, the people making, making a fool out of you or ridiculing you. Um, but... and hence the title of the talk that's not here anymore. Anyway, um, 10 years later, we can actually say we did it. Um, <clears throat> we have, I think big Bitcoin is around the 10th biggest money by buying power. There's like 10 state currencies still that, that in, in which more buying power is stored than, than in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is bigger now than the Canadian dollar or the Australian dollar. Maybe it's in the dip right now we're on spot number 12 or something like that. Um, <coughs> we had a network uptime from something like 99.9999%. Here's some people here who can give you an actually more exact number. Um, we have thousands of copycats that try to kind of get market share that actually got some market share, but when people kind of woke up, it looks like that whole thing um, is reversing again. Um, we have banks, governments, central banks, corporations all want to uh, copy that success. They either want to copy that success by creating their own coin somehow, <coughs> or they want to be part of that success by, uh, by 
trying to join the movement, like you have bankers now wearing wearing black hoodies, yeah, coming to hackers conferences and talking about how they are going to disrupt uh, the world with their Bitcoin bank account that they're going to offer you, and so on. Um, <coughs> Let me make a little diversion here. Um, the companies that uh, claim that it is a good idea for you to store their bit your Bitcoin on their website um, and to give the task to them to receive transactions for you and to send transactions for you, they really very strongly remind me of a, of a scene in the Bible. Um, <coughs> That scene is, you might remember, the only moment in uh, the New Testament when Jesus Christ gets violent. Does anybody here remember? <laughs> there is one person and another one. Um, so that was when Jesus came into the temple of Jerusalem and saw the money changers and, and, and money lenders. And he literally turned violent and threw over their tables and he had to be thrown out by security out of the temple and so on. So you're like, oh, wow, that's kind of interesting. Um, the situation was that people actually had sound money. They had, I don't know what kind of Palestinian money. They had the Roman denarius, which at the time was actual sound money, like uh, far beyond 90% silver. It took them 400 years to inflate that away. Um, so people had actually sound money for trade, but at the temple where you had to pay your tax, you first had to buy the temple money, a certain kind of coin. And the people who, uh, had, who sold you this temple coin for your sound money, um, of course, took their cut. They had monopolies and so on and so on. That's what Jesus Christ uh, got so pissed off about. Um, <coughs> so... Another point is, I believe we can say that Bitcoin is digital gold, to gold 2.0, or a safe haven for the recession to come, um, has been recognized and established even by pff, hedge fund managers and and by the banking world. Um, you can see that you can see that in the news. You can read it online, but I can tell you that e that also from one to one. Uh, talks with people from with bankers, with central bankers, with politicians, with law enforcement, and I had these talks over the last decade, a lot of them. Um, I can tell you one thing: um, everybody from their side. Please remember my definition: everybody from their side um, who has the task in their organization to deal with Bitcoin to somehow try to get it under control, to find the mean people who sold Mariana on black markets and so on and so on. Every banker, every law enforcement, every central banker, every politician who understands Bitcoin also has Bitcoin. Um, and I found that out in so many personal uh, talks and discussions, and I find that like really interesting. I think that is a, a, this beautiful Trojan horse function of Bitcoin because you have organizations that are threatened by Bitcoin, obviously, but the people working inside these organizations and have the task to deal with this threat, quickly understand why Bitcoin is actually a threat. I was talking to one financial regulator and I found out like he has Bitcoin because he told me he bought this or that sword for his online game. I was like, oh, you actually hold Bitcoin? His answer was literally, yeah, I'm not a fool, <laughs> you know? Um, so. That's the official part uh, where I would go like, oh, let me, yeah, what does it mean? The end of the experiment of Bitcoin. Um, for so many years, we have called Bitcoin an experiment. And I would, this is the official part, I would herewith declare the end of Bitcoin, the experiment, and announce Bitcoin the reality as an established fact of our world. I. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I really think Bitcoin is not going to go anywhere. I think it's quite obviously Bitcoin is not going to go anywhere anymore. And since it's not going to go anywhere anymore, and because of its properties as 
sound money as literally the hardest money ever built. We had only this week uh, Bavarian Landesbank, blah, 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 created. Somebody is uh, nodding. Um, so was it some kind of specialist, some kind of currency specialist from banks, and they actually came to the conclusion Bitcoin is the ultimate hard money. And what we know, uh, what all of history tells us is that the harder money will always replace the weaker money. So uh, if Bitcoin's not going away anymore, we know where it's going to go. So this is basically the moment where we could go like, hey, we won the war. <coughs> But um, we can, what we can say for sure is that we want technologically, we built the sound money, the sound money is there, and it cannot be taken away. That means the weak money has to compete with it and is going to lose. So we won technologically, but have we won for good? Have we won? Was it that? Was it it? Um, so I want to take a closer look again at these two aspects that I described uh, earlier on in my talk. Um, sound money, I think we all understand that. Money that cannot be inflated by the state, um, that, has a, that has a hard cap and so on, that, that cannot be inflated by anybody. Um, that's the one part and we achieved that. F but freedom of transaction, freedom of transaction <coughs> um, is not anything that you can establish as a fact and put it in the world and now it's there and it cannot go away anymore. Um, why is freedom of transaction so important for me to want to emphasize it here again today? Um, I sincerely believe that freedom of transaction is the forgotten basic human right amongst uh, freedom to travel, freedom of speech, uh, freedom to assemble. There is no freedom of transaction in any document, in any declaration of human rights, in any constitution, in anything, anywhere. And uh, this is weird um, on, on the first few. Um, but on the other hand, you realize that we never had to fight for it. We always had freedom of transaction. The past where we come from, we used, to, we, used to, we used all physical money and you could use physical money without anybody stopping you. You could go into the back room and do your trade. Um, but we are moving into the digital realm now. <coughs> and everything, our whole lives are becoming digital. And I believe that in a digital world, freedom of transaction is an absolutely vital superhuman right that you need to have in order to carry out all your other human rights. In a digital world, uh, I mean, of what value is freedom, to s freedom of speech when you're a dissident uh, somewhere and you cannot have your internet access or your blogging platform, pl platform in a way that you can pay it anonymously? Do you have free speech as a dissident when the government can find out who said that? No, you can't. What, wh of what worth is freedom to assemble, to meet up, if you cannot anonymously buy a train ticket to go to the assembly. If you look at any of the declared human rights, you will find out that they mean nothing without uh, freedom of transaction. Um, <clears throat> I'm totally into biblical metaphors here today. <laughs> and I wanna, I mean, just, just imagine, um, we're getting, societies are getting rid of, of actual fiat cash, of the actual coins and, 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 and banknotes. Make no mistake, uh, cash money will be abolished. There is no other way for our economies to move on without abolishing cash. There is no way to go further than 0.5, uh, minus 0.5, interest, uh, per percent interest rates. There is no way um, to force people to keep their money in banks in, in, in a world where that money is being bailed in and so on. Um, the abolish, uh, to, to abolish cash is 
a prerogative for our current financial system to keep continuing. That means all your money will be in digital form and traceable. Every chewing gum you buy, every cup of coffee, every train ticket, every everything um, will be um, will be recorded and the government or whoever uh, or Facebook maybe <laughs> in the future, I don't know, um, will always have the possibility to stop you from interacting economically with anybody. The government can stop you from buying a fucking package of chewing gum in that cashless society. So here's the other um, biblical metaphor. Let me read to you from the book of Revelations, the King James Bible. Uh, book of Revelations, chapter 13, paragraph 16 to 18. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. I find it quite quite mind blowing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not some kind of some kind of hardcore Catholic or Christian or anything. I do like the teachings of Jesus Christ, but I also like the ones of Buddha. Um, so um, don't get me wrong. I just find this um, a great metaphor to actually describe a world without cash money and digital cash is our only rescue f in that future where we will not have the cash we are used to have digital cash is literally the only rescue um <coughs> so again look at we we are very often talking about and this is this, this whole austrian economics um scene libertarians uh, bitcoiners crypto enthusiasts um, talking about sound money, um, but we don't talk about freedom of transaction that much. And I was thinking about it, I was like, does sound money actually mean that you have freedom of transaction? And you clearly come to the conclusion, no. Sound, soundness of money, hardness of money, and the right to transact without anybody stopping you from it, do not depend on each other. Um, you can imagine a sound money, you could imagine uh, a, a digital currency created by governments that has the monetary qualities of Bitcoin, like pff, uh, government could throw out this kind of protocol and say like, okay, nobody can change the protocol, but in the protocol, they could build blacklists and whitelists and, and, and all kinds of stuff to um, be able to stop people from transacting, <coughs> be able to confiscate money, be able to reverse transactions. Soundness and hardness of soundness of money, hardness of currency does not have much to do with freedom of transaction. Um, you can also imagine the other way around. You could have freedom of trans. I, I now have freedom of transaction with euro cash but it's not sound money. So you can have sound money without freedom of transaction and you can have freedom of transaction with sound money without sound money. But I think um, I would not want to have a future without either. <coughs> um, so what about freedom of transaction? Um, I made a few, no uh, or I copied a few notes here from another talk of mine. Let me just read them. Freedoms that can be taken away, always will be taken away. That it is basically the nature of government. Government is here not to protect your freedoms or give you freedoms. Government is here uh, to explain to you that they're protecting your freedoms while they're taking it away. To find nice ways that make you feel good about your freedoms having taken away. I, I hear, I know, I'm, I have quite a few friends who are of a different opinion here than me who think that we can fix democracy, we can fix government. Uh, I don't believe that, but I think both uh, views should be respected. So, freedom of transaction, like any other freedom, is never achieved for good. 
You have to fight for your freedoms every morning the second you get out of bed or your freedoms are gone. So once the fight to achieve freedom of transaction has been won and was successful, that very second the fight to defend that freedom starts. And if you stop, uh, if we stop defending um, freedom of transaction, um, <coughs> we will not have that freedom very much longer. So. <coughs> Um, bad news, <coughs> sorry, bad news is, I wrote the question here, who gives a fuck about freedom anyway? I if you look around, I mean, I mean, obviously on this conference here <laughs> is a gathering of freedom-loving uh, people um, who know why they are here, but you only have to think of your neighbors, probably of your family, uh, your work colleagues, and so on and so on. It's quite obvious that uh, freedom is in no, in, in no way any value in our society anymore. If freedom, if people would give a fuck about freedom, Quite frankly, Angela Merkel would be in jail and Edward Snowden would be president of the United States and all secret services on the planet would have been abolished by now. Um, <coughs> governments can restrict our freedoms more and more and in astonishingly obvious ways and no revolution breaks out. I'm not here to explain why that is the case, but it is my observation and I need to think about um, <coughs> how to deal with that. And um, <coughs> I come to the conclusion, I quote myself again here, money not only needs to be resistant to dictatorship, to dictatorship but also to democracy. Money must not be subject to any democratic process. Um, so the question arises, how do we, we have a sort of freedom of, of, of transaction now in Bitcoin, but not really. We have, we have chain analysis, blockchain analysis and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, clearly people, some very smart people are working on ways to increase privacy, anonymity, and fungibility in Bitcoin, which is like of ut ut utmost importance, um, more important than scalability, uh, literally the most important uh, thing about Bitcoin. I believe if we don't, if we don't get it private and fungible, then there's no need to scale it, really. Um, <coughs> so, and I think I think there's there's two things that we can we can focus on <coughs> in order to not only keep that level uh, or degree of freedom of transaction that we now have, but in actually to, to increase it and, and finally secure it. And one is that we need rock solid cockroach protocols that resist not only technological attacks and are resilient to legal attacks, but cannot be changed by the opinions of the masses. Cockroach protocol because cockroaches supposedly even survive a nuclear winter. So this is the kind of thing that I imagine. Um, I see some people here who are working on on uh, things like that. Um, but the other part is really that 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 kind of. <coughs> soft part, the, the understanding that freedom of transaction is a really important thing. Sound money doesn't really need to be explained in the long run. You can explain, it might make sense to explain to somebody why Bitcoin is a better money, a harder currency than the Euro, but it's not actually necessary because in not only the long run, in the short to medium uh, future, 
people will understand the soundness of money. S sound money explains itself as soon as it is in competition with not so sound money. And all the people who don't understand sound money and hold on to their not so sound money, well, they will just have a bad time. Uh, and during that time, they will understand what the difference between sound money um, and not so sound money is, but freedom of transaction is something so, uh, while sound money is something that in, at the end of the day everybody who has understood it and who, who holds it will realize, yeah, it's a good thing to have. That is it's actually a good thing. Um, freedom of transaction is not such an obvious good thing for many people, especially uh, when we hear stories about, and we will hear many more stories about all the evil stuff that has been done with Bitcoin and that can be done with Bitcoin. I think these, uh, we see these kind of waves of propaganda against Bitcoin. Sometimes you have a week and every day you read like all the crimes that Bitcoin has been enabling or something like that. Um, and clearly, <laughs> we have not seen anything yet. Um, the real threat that Bitcoin poses uh, to the current system has not really yet been understood. And um, <coughs> the existing system, the legacy system, will get more, will get the, the more desperate, um, the more it fucks up. And it is about to fuck up. Um, um, don't have to go into, into uh, day-to-day -day economics right now, I believe everybody looks at minus 0.4% uh, uh, interest rates and so on and so on. But um, <coughs> where I see a danger is in is the fact that, that freedom of transaction <coughs> as a good thing cannot be so easily understood by a lot of people, and a lot of people uh, will just follow uh, what their media tell them. Um, they they will get scared because of. I mean, I mean, when they prohibited gold or the the ownership of gold I, in I think 1930. No, 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 hold on. When that was when in both cases when they when they prohibited the ownership of gold in 1933, 31. No, 71 was when Nixon took the backing of the the gold backing of the dollar away, but that's the other. In both cases, they argued it. They argued it to to make the population safe, to protect the population and the dollar from the evil gold speculators. Like gold went up and up and up, you know, in price for a reason, <laughs> you know, uh, because they inflated the dollar. You could actually say the dollar went down and down and down because they printed so much of it. But at the end of the day, most people will believe their president when he tells them that the evil gold speculators and in the future it will be the evil Bitcoin speculators um, who fucked up the economy and that's why freedom of transaction is a really bad thing. Um, anyway, bottom bottom line, <coughs> what me what what really concerns me right now is how can we um, how can we promote freedom of transaction as a basic human right? We will not be able uh, to get the United Nations to write that into some some uh, some human rights declaration or anything like that. I can promise you that. <laughs> so it's not about trying to convince uh, political organizations or, or or it's not about convincing them uh, from the fa about the fact that freedom of transaction is a good thing and important for all of us. It is it is literally important for us to convince all our fellow human beings. So. Um <coughs> This is the end of my talk, I believe. Um, so yeah, I would like to sh I would like to push freedom of transaction uh, into the focus, and this is something this is something where everybody can do something. You might sit there and go, like, as I said before, you know, I'm not a cryptographer. I'm 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 really the worst coder that I know, so I cannot contribute to Bitcoin and to this wonderful movement of liberation in these kinds of things. You probably can't either. Maybe one, two, or three in this audience are brilliant enough to, to help us technologically. The rest of us, 
I think for the rest of us, the most important thing is to explain Bitcoin to the rest of humanity and also to explain to them why freedom of transaction is such an important thing. And okay, let me make my last sense. So I would have suggestions how to do that. Just be creative or let's do a workshop on it or whatever. But uh, if it has to be, just go and tell them that in a digital world without freedom of transaction, the beast has won and we will be living in hell. And tonight when we drink, do us a favor now and then when you bring out a toast, say to freedom of transaction. Thank you very much. No questions, that's cool. <laughs> we have or some time so we can do a few questions, I guess, if you want I'm to. fine. Yeah, okay, so any question? Yes, it will be hard to get there. Or I will, I will just use it like human leather. Yeah, uh, I, I heard uh, about your opinion on uh, exchanges and online wallets. Uh, Actually, I'm running one. Do you really consider me evil? <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, now look at that hat, right? You said you're on a hacker conference wearing a black hat and asking if you're... No, um, seriously. Um, no, I don't want to... Or maybe I should drop names. I don't know. I, I know one, two or three companies in this realm who I know are really good people who want to just bring Bitcoin forward. And uh, I quote one CEO. Uh, I, I'm not saying from which company, but he, he was literally like, um, because I told him the, exactly that story. I told him, look, but in, uh, I believe you are literally in the situation of the money changers in the temple scene, <laughs> you know, in the New Testament. So, um, uh, no, that wasn't the problem. That wasn't the problem. The money changers would have ripped people off and scammed them out of their hard-earned money if they would have been in any other place. They just took the temple gave them importance, you know. Um, no, literally, uh, we have companies uh, that I would fully trust, but seriously, the majority, come on, look at people like Coinbase, look at people, look at people like BitPay, look at all these, uh, the, these companies. Where you can clearly see um, they are literally working against the whole decentralization thing against the whole peer-to-peer -peer thing and it actually it probably makes sense for them because they're corporations they have ceos ceos are bound by law to do the best for their shareholders and this is the best they can do for share for, for their shareholders um i'm not saying that you personally are a, are an evil person sir i don't know you and your company mm -hmm. I understand that we need on and off ramps. I also understand, uh, and I see a few faces here in this room, that when we started with Bitcoin, literally no fucking exchange has existed and we didn't need any fucking exchange, right? Okay, you can, uh, people want to have their convenience and whatever. Um, <coughs> your argument is adoption, <coughs> exchanges, KYZ and AML on and off ramps um, boost adoption, but it's a kind of adoption that I literally don't give a fuck about. Um, I'd rather, I've said this before on this conference last year, I'd rather see a slow adoption uh, of Bitcoin by people who understand what they're actually doing uh, than a fast adoption by people who want to jump onto a train that made some other people some money without having a clue and then taking the first digital bearer asset of humanity and storing it in a bank. No. That's my personal thing. Okay, we have a second question here and then... Uh, can you explain your optimism why a currency that by design is 
needs bolt-ons and add-ons and expansions to provide some sort of privacy will ultimately end up to provide freedom of transaction? That needs bolts and add-ons and stuff. Um, why would I care? Why, if I have a, a, a proven, evidently private sidechain on which I can transact my Bitcoin, why would I care? And I guess that's what you mean with add-ons, something like a sidechain or something on top, like a coin join or something like that. Um, no, I don't care at all. As long as we can uh, achieve that privacy, why would I care about the fact that it's achieved with add-ons? Why would you? Okay, I'm a complex person, that's okay. <laughs> no. Okay, we have a question. So crypto is a hedge against uh, fiat money, gold and silver are also hedges. Do you think there is a, a place in the future for those two asset classes as uh, in the time forward? And then secondly, negative interest rates are only a measure of desperation. So even if they go minus two, minus three, it will not be enough. They just buy time and then they have to go to minus four and then to minus 10 and then to Absolutely. minus banana. Absolutely. So <laughs> it's just in the long run, uh, something has to break and what is then the, the true end game? And is our th job then not to just winter the storm? They cannot go around and kill everybody because if they start doing playing that game, then I will have to start that to play that game as well. So, so I heard two questions. Uh, I believe uh, first of all, I see no reason why at least gold will not keep a certain uh, property as a store of value in the future, just for the simple fact it's been around for so long. Um, may, may, maybe when when it's getting really when it's getting cheaper to when it's getting cheaper to to mine uh, an ounce of gold on the moon or some asteroid then the price of an ounce of gold right now is that's far away, that's far away yeah anyhow uh, yeah but i'm look i'm uh, i love gold <laughs> um but i'm here to talk about bitcoin yeah but I, I i don't see any reason why why gold would not have a a, a role in the future and your second question was uh, was about Interest rates, of course. Of rates there is no, there is no sustainability in lowering interest rates further and further. There, there just is none. This is like it's, it's so crazy. It took me so long now to understand um, why people, how can there even be people, organizations, institutions, whatever, who buy a thirty-year German bond at minus 0.1% interest. It just didn't click with me. I was like, uh, you know, uh, it's just, I'm not smart enough to understand. Then, now they're selling oh, minus 0. Point, hey, this is to you. Oh, look, he's asking a question and then he's talking, okay, fuck you then. Um, so, anyway, I didn't understand it. Now they're selling minus 0.3% bonds. And now it clicked with me. It was like, of course, the guy who bought the minus 0.1% was smart enough to know that the minus 0.3 is going to come and then o minus 0.1 was a great deal and he can sell the minus 0.1% bond on to somebody else for, minus o point for an extra 0.1% uh, premium. Then the guy who buys that actually still makes a better deal than the guy who, bu who buys the bond for o minus 0.3%. But it's crazy. It's madness. It's, it's madness, and, and the faster it goes, and it goes faster and faster, uh, you will see that they um, come up with either abolishing cash, because they have to, at, at I don't know, estimations go like at, uh, at minus two or three percent, every single little bank account will suffer negative interest rates, not only the big companies and big banks or something. And other estimates say like that at the latest at minus 5%, people will want to take their money out of the bank and store it in their mattress. And, and that moment will come uh, and they will have to, th that's, wh that's why cash necessarily will have to be abolished. 
This, this answer was for this gentleman. He didn't hear it, though. <laughs> yes. So, but there was the other raised hand. Am I right or no? Okay. So, uh, thank you for your talk. Really great. And um, regarding adoption, slow or fast, is on one side we should have a proper adoption and keep it a little slow pace because when we look at the infrastructure, we have to build out a lot. But if you're listening to people like Markus Krall from Germany, he's clearly saying that we will have a European banking crisis within the next two years because the negative interest, is, uh, interest rates are definitely destroying the whole um, banking business model. And um, I would well, like to hear your this. thoughts on I this. Don't know the how gentleman? much time do we have? Is that your question? How much time do we have? Yeah, like how much time do we have? Look, uh, I mean, 10 years ago, I would have said in five years, and then they came up with negative interest rates, so I don't know what kind of voodoo they still have up their sleeves. <laughs> um, <coughs> but it's, it's quite obvious. You have to look at certain things you, uh, in regards to negative interest rates. You can actually see the first banks in Germany moving into unprofitable territory. <laughs> No, Deutsche is not there yet, and Commerzbank not either, but they're near there. There is actually a nice chart online that shows you which bank is actually already unprofitable. It's still less than 10% or something, but the others are. And the further you move down with the interest rates, then you have the problem of, um, of zombie corporations. I can, only, I can only speak about Germany here, but and this is something that literally nobody looks at. You, re, you, you, you don't read about that anywhere. Um, turns out that the average percentage of companies in, in, in any given economy that go bankrupt is about 1.5 to 2% a year. That's like a healthy cleaning of, you know, these are, these are companies that are not competitive anymore, that make the wrong product, that have the wrong marketing or whatever. They go bankrupt for some reason. 1.5 to 2% uh, in any uh, economy, literally, that is kind of, uh, kind of function. Since 2008, since we have quantitative easing, since the banks are literally forced to find someone where they can stuff the money in. Funnily enough, that number dropped to below 0.5. That is such a clear sign. That means that 1.0 to 1.5 percent of all corporations every year that should go bankrupt because they are not profitable anymore did not go bankrupt because they got this cheap money. That started in 2008, it's 2019. That means that 15 literally 15% of the German economy has by now to be considered zombie companies that will just blow up as soon as the flow of cheap money stops. And the flow of cheap money stops when the ba banks stop getting, uh, stop being profitable at all, and that's what we just talked about. So, uh, but you don't, but no need. I, I don't have an answer. As I said, ten years ago, I would have said in five years. But who knows? <laughs> all this voodoo <laughs> they uh, come up with. But uh, yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I also want to make one point. Is it, I also want to make one point. This is nothing I wished for. Uh, amongst gold bucks and also about Bitcoin enthusiasts, uh, you find a lot of people who are literally waiting for this crash to happen because then gold will shine or Bitcoin, I will have Bitcoin and everything else will go down. I'm not looking forward to this moment. I hope it takes as long as possible. I hope it's a slow decline and I hope it's slow enough so more and more people can learn and understand and, and how to get out of it. That would be so much because if we get this complete and total crash, it won't be funny. Also, not if you have gold, and also not if you have Bitcoin. It just won't be funny. So, right on that point, um, would you call it then an apocalyptic cult? Because it seems to be a quite uh, present yes, value. Yes, central banking is uh, an apocalyptic cult. <laughs> <laughs> yes.
So we ran out of time. So I would like thank to York for his presentation and thank you all for coming here. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>